today as we talk about combating antibiotic resistance in companion animals. I am Jen Granick. I am a veterinarian and a faculty member at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. And I am joined today by Dr. Amanda Bedoin. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Amanda? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Amanda Bedoin. I am a veterinarian and an epidemiologist and I work at the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, my work focuses on uh, how we use antibiotics across the one health spectrum. So in healthcare and animal health and, and think about the consequences of those antibiotics when they wind up in our natural environment. And uh, Amanda and I, along with our colleague, Emma, um, work on antibiotic use in companion animals because that's what I care about. I'm a small animal internist. So we're here to talk to you today and answer some really common questions and we'll have time at the end um, for questions that you may have. So I'll start. Amanda, um, why don't you uh, begin by explaining what antibiotic resistance is and why it's important in dogs and cats? Yes, a great place to start. So just as a reminder, antibiotics, they're chemical substances that essentially are produced by um, living microorganisms with the intention to either kill or inhibit the growth of other microorganisms. Um, and so antibiotic resistance is the ability of microorganisms like bacteria um, to survive and to multiply in the presence of antibiotics. This is a natural occurrence and it occurs because the microorganisms are trying to adapt to those external pressures. Um, so external selective pressures uh, placed on bacteria by antibiotics can lead to um, development of point mutations, um, selection for resistance and then multiplication um, and proliferation of those resistant organisms. Bacteria can also share genetic material amongst themselves. So um, horizontal gene transfer um, or the movement of um, nucleic acid with essentially the instructions for resistance, that can happen between um, individual bacteria of the same species, but also across bacteria of different genuses. And really this horizontal transfer of resistance genes is a, a, a major factor in the reason that we have antibiotic resistance issues at the local, the national, and the global level. Um, so awareness of sort of those, those selective pressures that are um, placed on bacteria by antibiotics, and then once resistance occurs, proliferation of those bugs, and then sharing of that, that genetic material or the resistance instructions. So, so that's really how it happens and why do we care? Well, of course, we, we know that we care about antibiotic resistance because we care about clinically resistant infections. We want to make sure that we as people, um, but also as our veterinary, for our veterinary patients, that we have infections that we can treat and that we can treat with antibiotics that that are appropriate and aren't going to cause harmful side effects. Um, so we're concerned about clinical resistance. And I think that um, maybe I'll just mention, even though we might um, be able to talk about it a little bit later when we talk about some resources, but AVMA in 2020 did put out a report highlighting the resistance uh, threats to our um, veterinary patients. And what's nice about the report is it's, it's about, you know, antibiotic resistance in animal patients and how that impacts them, not necessarily, um, you know, which is also an issue, the, the zoonotic disease implications of resistant bacteria. But the AVMA report is about how does antibiotic resistance impact our patients. So I encourage you, you all to, to have a look at that report. Um, so that is that's how it happens. And I think maybe Jen, especially from your perspective, uh, as a clinician, maybe it would be helpful to share some of the common reasons that, um, that we know that veterinarians use antibiotics. So if we know that antibiotic use can help contribute to this problem, why are we even using them in the first place? Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so we've actually done some studies um, ourselves to look at the common reasons why antibiotics are prescribed. And there are some differences um, in the reasons for antibiotic prescriptions for patients that are seen on an outpatient basis versus those that are hospitalized and um, treated as inpatients. So most common, commonly um, antibiotics are prescribed 
on an outpatient basis for patients with skin infections and then ear infections. So um, pyoderma and otitis are really the top two reasons that we found in our studies um, for antibiotic prescriptions. Uh, other reasons, as you might expect, would be ocular infections, so conjunctivitis or ulcers. Um, diarrhea is a big reason as well, and then respiratory and urinary tract disease. For hospitalized patients, um, you know, while all of these things can be common in hospitalized patients, respiratory infections are probably the number one reason that we've seen in the studies that we've done. Um, typically, aspiration pneumonia, um, but also community inquire, uh, acquired um, respiratory infections. Um, skin infections that uh, like necrotizing, um, skin infections also, um, or, or, um, post-surgical um, or surgery site infections, so post-surgical wound infections, um, gastrointestinal disease, and then urinary uh, infections as well as uh, sepsis and peritonitis. So those are the reasons for hospitalized patient um, antibiotic use. Um, but it, you, know, you can see that this is across the board and across systems. So really any system can result in an infection that requires uh, bacteria, it, that due to bacterial infection that requires antibiotic treatment. Yeah, and, and Jen, I think what's interesting about what you just said is we know, and this is something that you know I encounter every day in my job of thinking about antibiotics across humans and animals, and we have like common syndromes for which we use antibiotics and also common syndromes for which antibiotic use is either inappropriate or unnecessary. And so, um, so it's, it's in, in human um, medicine, it's estimated that 30 to 50% of antibiotic prescriptions are not needed or are inappropriate. Um, and really the 50% is um, when we think about acute upper respiratory tract infections, that's when a lot of the inappropriate and unnecessary prescribing is happening in our human outpatient settings. Um, and so we, we do know that there's a, there's a role for thinking about, you know, is an antibiotic needed, but also what's the appropriate drug? Because a large um, percentage of those you know, people who are getting an antibiotic for an upper respiratory tract infection are not receiving what the recommended first line antibiotic is. And we do know um, from some of the work that, that you just described that we've been looking at, but also from some publications um, from, for example, Banfield, that in veterinary medicine, we have some of those same challenges. You know, how are we aligning with the best practice for prescribing, especially for upper respiratory tract infections? Um, and one sort of really great parallel is in, in healthcare, there's a sort of a metric avoidance of antibiotics for acute bronchitis. Um, and so, you know, avoiding the use of antibiotics in these situations where there's um, a bronchitis diagnosis. Um, and, and we see, have seen the same thing, you know, for example, in a report from Banfield in 2017 about how um, prescribing for canine uh, bronchitis uh, was, not, was not that great. So we, we can sort of align some of these major um, inappropriate and unnecessary use across the species as well. So um, Jen, again, from your clinical perspective, maybe you can share a little bit about why you think either inappropriate or unnecessary prescribing does occur. Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, the parallels that you just drew between veterinary um, patient conditions like upper respiratory infections and bronchitis and those condition, same conditions in humans, I think the you know, it's sort of globally known, these pressures are real. Sometimes they're pressures from the, the patient or the pet owner, you know, wanting desperately to make their pet well. It's really distressing when you have a sick animal. And so oftentimes they're presenting those animals to us and asking for our help. And um, antibiotics often are a way that we can help. I think that um, the, the question, that you posed first is, is an antibiotic needed at this time? Because um, oftentimes upper respiratory infections, for example, in cats are viral. And so unless they're complicated by a bacterial infection that the pet can't clear on their own, um, we don't necessarily need to prescribe an antibiotic. And there's some great guidelines um, that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, to help us know when prescribing is appropriate and when it's not appropriate. But the truth is that 
Um, when we're in an exam room with a pet and a really concerned owner, there um, there's a lot going on. And so, you know, when we're making our uh, decisions about prescribing, it's not necessarily just what our medical knowledge is. There is a whole social emotional aspect of prescribing that I think we really need, need to fairly acknowledge in order for us to um, make rational decisions. So um, I have a colleague that says for veterinarians, uh, prescribing is is an emotional um, is an emotional decision, and I think it's really true. Um, so you know, I'm sure we've all been in an exam room. I've been in a situation where I've had you know an uh, an older gentleman comes in with a um, a cat with an upper respiratory infection that's you know not eating well because the cat can't smell that well, and he's distressed and um, shares with me. Um, beyond what the cat's clinical signs are, we often, you know, are sharing things beyond that, right? So he shared with me that, you know, this was his wife's cat, he lost his wife three months ago, and he really doesn't want anything to happen to the cat, because it's his last living reminder. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of emotions that are, are in that exam room with us besides just our medical knowledge and our medical decision making. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. Um, and you know what are the solutions for that? You know, uh, client education and taking the time to explain, you know, both the 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 really great benefits of antibiotic use, but also the potential um, uh, harms of antibiotic use. And we really need to constantly balance be balancing those when we're making these prescribing decisions. Um, there. There are also situations which I think we deal with very frequently in veterinary medicine, which is this idea of diagnostic uncertainty. Um, so we have a patient and we have our, you know, our differential list, but we may not have the ability um, for many reasons, oftentimes financial constraints um, that are imposed upon the, the pet owner, you know, maybe they don't have the, the, the funds to do an extensive diagnostic workup. And so we have um, limitations uh, that are placed on us that mean that we may not know exactly what's going on and we have to make dis clinical decisions and treatment decisions without that knowledge. So a lot of empiric prescribing occurs. And for many veterinarians, and we've actually surveyed veterinarians here in Minnesota um, and asked them, you know, how, how do you feel about antibiotic prescribing in these situations of diagnostic uncertainty? And so if you're one of those vets that feels like maybe an antibiotic is safer to prescribe than not prescribe in those situations, you're not alone. 80% of vets that we surveyed either sometimes or frequently felt that the risk of withholding an antibiotic in a case of diagnostic uncertainty was greater than the risk of providing that antibiotic. And I would say that's the way I kind of grew up and um, when I went to vet school and, and in my early days of practice. Um, as uh, an internist now, I do often get referred patients that have um, antibiotic resistant infections, multi-drug resistant infections. And so I think, um, I think if we, you know, for those of us that have been in practice for a while, if we reflect back on our early days versus what we're seeing now, we definitely are seeing a lot more antibiotic resistance. So this idea of um, antibiotics may not be harmful um, and, and by withholding them, we may be doing more harm, I think um, needs a bit of a closer look because there are risks of antibiotic use. Obviously there's the risk of adverse drug effects. We've seen that, um, you know, things like liver toxicity with doxycycline use, for example, but there, you know, aminoglycosides and uh, renal toxicity, there, there are certainly examples that we all have off the top of our head. Um, I think that the, the risk of systemic antibiotic use um, sometimes is not realized until much later. You know, maybe we're treating a skin infection with systemic antimicrobials, and then, you know, it's a, you know, female Labrador retriever, and three years down the road, um, because she's repeatedly been treated with antibiotics, she may have a urinary tract infection when she's sort of of that age where we start to see urinary incontinence, and now... Um, the infection is antimicrobial resistant because of her his past history of antimicrobial use. So that's a risk that's not an immediate risk, but maybe something to think about further down the line. And then I guess the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is this idea of the effects of antibiotics on the microbiome. Um, 
we in veterinary medicine is really an exciting time because we're learning so much more about the microbiome, um, particularly the gastrointestinal microbiome. And, um, and we know that the effects of antibiotics can be really long lasting. Um, and in patients, particularly young patients that are still developing a stable microbiome, antibiotic use early in life may have really long standing consequences there. So I think um, when I prescribe now and I'm sort of debating whether an antibiotic is appropriate, particularly in these cases of diagnostic uncertainty, I kind of verbalize the risks and benefits to the owner and um, and, and sometimes that's compelling enough for them to say, well, what additional information do we need in order to make a safer choice um, or to feel more confident in our choice? And then sometimes um, we talk through uh, potentially doing some more diagnostics if that's at all possible so we can make um, an appropriate decision. But it, it's, it's a real problem in veterinary medicine, um, especially because the majority of our patients don't have insurance. And so we just can't do everything that we wanna do. And, and so which conditions do you see either in your own medicine practice or you know, in animals that are coming to you from a GP? Um, you know, what conditions do you often see getting antibiotics when maybe they're not needed? Yeah, so uh, good question. I think the... Um, Upper respiratory infections in cats, I think, is a big one, um, and and it's because it's just it's a it's a hard condition to do diagnostics around. Honestly, like you're not get like bacterial cultures of the nose are not useful because we know bacteria live in the nose, um, and so a lot of times we're basing the whether to treat with an antibiotic or not um, on clinical signs, and so. Um, the International Society for um, Companion Animal Infectious Disease has, pr has produced some guidelines for respiratory infections in dogs and cats, and they're free, they're online. Um, and, and their recommendation is this idea of watchful waiting. Um, and that means that, you know, most cats with, with upper respiratory infections is viral in origin, and an antibiotic is not going to help unless that... Um, that infection is complicated by bacterial infection. And so a lot of the clinical signs that we tend to react to are things like cats not wanting to eat well or being more lethargic and then having you know, nasal discharge. Obviously, if it's clear, it's probably not complicated by bacteria. But I think the confusing thing is like, what if it's yellow or opaque? Well, we expect that white blood cells are going to respond to viral infections just like they would to bacterial infections. So the presence of opaque nasal discharge does not necessarily mean that there, there's a bacterial infection. And um, so, so many times we are prescribing when we don't necessarily need to. Um, and the, the ISCA guidelines suggest, you know, if the clinical signs have been around for greater than 10 days and are not resolving, if the patient is febrile, um, or if the nasal discharge is really obviously infected, like it's green or brown or bloody, then those are indications to intervene. But otherwise, there's a lot of things that we can do, just like if you went to your doctor with a cold, um, they'd probably tell you, you know, humidify the environment so that it breaks up secretions and allows, um, you know, a sort of a stuffy nose to be relieved. So those are things that I recommend instead of prescribing. Um, cats are really motivated by smell as far as their appetite is concerned. So for those cats, sometimes just warming up the food, um, making the food a little bit stinky by like putting some tuna juice on it, um, providing canned food uh, that, you know, all of those things may increase the appetite. Um, and then appetite stimulants are certainly something that we can do to sort of get the patient through um, the time until they're starting to recover. Um, so that, so upper respiratory infections in cats is a big one. I would say um, another one that's a bit tricky uh, that we already mentioned is, is bronchitis. Um, so community acquired um, uh, infectious respiratory um, disease syndrome in, in dogs um, it is another one where, you know, cough, coughs can be quite dramatic. Dogs can come in with this really sort of um, alarming dry cough. But if it's a dry cough and they're otherwise happy, healthy, eating, wagging their tail, um, usually those are situations where we don't need to treat the cough with antibiotics. Um, 
And then antibiotics would only be indicated if, you know, if again, the patient is febrile, lethargic, um, or there's indication of lower uh, respiratory infection. So that would be another one. And I would say the other, especially since we've discussed the microbiome, where I think my practice personally has changed really significantly since um, when I uh, first graduated to now is, is treating uh, diarrhea. So the, the old standby, which is metronidazole, um, is something that I, I don't use routinely as a first line or empiric therapy for diarrhea for a few reasons. Um, and most of those are based upon some really great new um, publications that have come out in the last handful of years. Uh, one, a, a few papers have looked at treating, metroni treating with metronidazole versus not treating with anything. So placebo in cases of acute diarrhea and patients that are otherwise healthy. Um, and there's really no difference to time to resolution. There's been another study where uh, uh, metronidazole was compared to probiotic compared to placebo. And again, no statistical difference between the time to resolution. So we often give metronidazole in a few days, the patients are better. And the truth is they may have just gotten better on their own. Um, there, there are other things that we can offer now instead of antibiotics. So things like probiotics and prebiotics um, that might be psyllium or that might be um, you know, dietary fiber um, in the form of, of um, diet change. So um, I think that there are, there are non-antibiotic things that I feel like I can go to to treat, but metronidazole is still really commonly used. And there are some new um, data too that suggests that metronidazole may have impacts on the microbiome that are um, not necessarily helpful. So um, they're, believe it or not, they're actually good clostridium in the gut. And if we treat with metronidazole, we are potentially um, decreasing the population of bacteria that might help to improve um, gut health and um, be anti-inflammatory or, um, or compete for space in, in the niche that um, otherwise would be available for pathogens. And so um, I think that's another area of common antibiotic prescribing that probably is not needed. And then maybe even more so maybe is potentially detrimental um, for, for many cases of diarrhea, certainly not all. Sometimes we do need to use antibiotics to treat diarrhea for infectious causes. Yeah, um, so I, guess, I was just gonna think, I just thought of one more. Sure. <laughs> and, and that was um, feline lower urinary tract, in, uh, feline lower urinary tract disease. So young cats um, usually don't have urinary tract infections, um, unless they're complicated by something else. Um, so usually it's just feline lower urinary tract disease that's not bacteria related. So, and, and particularly young male cats. Um, and so I think that that's another area where antibiotics might be prescribed where they're not, not really um, needed because there really is not a bacterial component to that disease. Sorry, what were you gonna say, Amanda? No, I was just gonna say, I, I think you mentioned the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Disease Guidelines for upper respiratory tract infection. So um, what, what else do we have guidelines like that for? Um, do we have them for some of these other conditions and do we have them for diarrhea? How do, how do people know what's the best choice? Yeah, so uh, good question. There are, um, in, the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Disease has produced uh, a few guidelines. So I already mentioned the respiratory infections and that those cover um, cats and dogs and both upper and lower respiratory tract infections and go through everything from diagnosis and um, diagnostic tests to uh, therapy and provide some uh, uh, good options for empiric therapy versus uh, therapies that maybe should be reserved for um, resistant infections or for infections in locations where um, typical empiric therapies might not reach. Uh, there are also guidelines for superficial pyoderma in dogs. And then there are guidelines for urinary tract infections in both dogs and cats. And again, that covers both lower and upper urinary tract infections. And so, um, those are really helpful because they provide some guidance, not only on what to use to treat, but when should we treat and when should we take this watchful waiting approach and what are the indicators 
um, for when that's not successful and we really do need to intervene. So they're really, really great resources. Um, we, I can share with you. Let's see here. So as a, as a group, <laughs> Amanda um, and, and Emma Balleg and I have um, created a, sort of a landing spot for a lot of really great resources that we've collected. Um, and, and we're always looking for more. So if you know of other resources, please contact us. We'd like to include them on our website. But we have this Antimicrobial Resistance and Stewardship Initiative website. It's arsi.umn.edu. And you can see that we have a tab for clinical resources. And we've, um, we actually have the antimicrobial prescribing guidelines linked in here. So all of those that I've talked to you about already. Um, for simplifying use um, for our clinicians in our hospital and students, we've actually um, created a pocket guide and this pocket guide basically um, provides those, uh, those antibiotics that are used for empiric treatment um, and kind of pulled that information from the guidelines. And so that's all available um, to be printed out if you like or available online. Um, we have some other resources that you may find useful. So, We've created a handbook of uh, antimicrobial stewardship and companion animals, and we have some really basic steps and all of the resources that are on our website are kind of linked into the handbook. So if this is something that you're um, passionate about and you want to um, take one small step towards improving antibiotic prescribing in your clinic, then you can check out this handbook. And it's free and available on our website. You can download it or view it online. Um, and then you can choose um, what is a reasonable and easy step to do in your clinics. Certainly, we're all strapped for time, especially in this pandemic year. It's been wild. Um, and so, you know, certainly don't look at this handbook and be like, oh, all these things, I can't possibly do all these things. Just find one that's easy. There are some really, really easy things to do. Um, and then if you find that that feels good and you've had success, that might be motivation to do the next small thing. Um, so the, the handbook is available. And then um, some of the some of the um, resources that are linked in there, um, I find to be really useful. So for example, actually I'll pull up the actual page here. So for example, we've talked a bit about um, cases in which Patients come in with, um, you know, obvious clinical signs that their owners are really concerned about, but we might not feel it's appropriate at that point to prescribe an antibiotic. And in those cases, we still need to provide this really concerned pet owner with something to do. We still need to provide our patients with some relief. That's our job. And so we can do that without prescribing antibiotics. And if that's the approach that we think is appropriate for our patient, then this could be a useful tool. Um, this is available on our website. It's also linked into the handbook. You can get it as a fillable PDF or as a Word document. And so you can put your clinic logo on it, whatever you want to do. Um, and then this provides some information for the pet owner. Hey, great, good news. Your pet does not have something that we need to treat with an antibiotic, but we want to make your pet feel better. You can click these different things. So whether it's diarrhea or a cough or a nasal discharge, whatever it is, it provides some explanation to the owner about why antibiotics are not needed. And then it provides some positive things that the pet owner can do at home or other things that you can provide for that pet owner to um, give to their um, uh, patient so that it we can make their, their pet feel better. So if it's diarrhea, maybe feed a plant, bland food and we may um, provide a diet to send home with them, um, warm up the food to make sure it smells really good, um, 
place a humidifier. So, and then any other things that you um, want to customize this to, you can to provide some positive treatment options for the um, pet's um, comfort care at home. Um, if you've prescribed any other medications, we talked about upper respiratory infections in cats, maybe they need um, an appetite stimulant. And then when to follow up. So if it's been X number of days and we're still having nasal discharge or it's been X number of days and diarrhea is still occurring, when do we want them to let us know that things aren't getting better? Or do we wanna set up a recheck exam? Um, and so you can customize this in any way you want, but it's a really good way to um, communicate to the owner, not only that antibiotics are not needed, but what are the positive steps that we can do to um, improve the comfort um, and provide care for, um, for that patient? Great. And Jen, I think this is actually a, before we get into talking about, you know, what we, what we hope to engage everybody on, I think it's a great spot to mention that um, communication and commitment are, are really important parts of antibiotic stewardship. ABMA has actually outlined um, core principles of stewardship. And the first is to make a commitment to stewardship. Um, the second is to advocate for a system of care to prevent common diseases. Uh, the third is to um, use antibiotics judiciously, which we've talked a bit about. Um, the, the fourth is to evaluate how you're using these antibiotics. And the fifth is to educate and build expertise. And so like Jen said, there's really something that every clinic can do to try to try to meet those core principles. And what you just showed is a great example of, of both education and commitment because you're showing the client um, that you don't wanna use antibiotics when they aren't needed because they might be harmful, um, but you're presenting it in a way that, that's providing education about how they can you know, help, their, help their pet. Um, the other thing that, that um, you, AVMA and, and we really want to, to communicate is that infection prevention is super important because if you don't have an infection to start with, you don't have to worry about what drug to choose. You don't have to worry about it being a resistant infection. And we also just without infections, um, we will use fewer antibiotics. And so there are things you can do to, um, to sort of uh, educate clients about uh, routine care, uh, making sure they're using preventives, all of these things that we know will help the pet owner to keep the animal healthy and prevent the need for antibiotics. But then also within your practice, you know, making sure that infection prevention um, protocols are, are intact so that animals aren't getting um, an infection at the clinic, for example, a surgical site infection or, or something like that. So I think um, some of those resources are really helpful to, to clients to sort of take that first step um, and to make it feel um, comfortable. Uh, so, so I don't know, Jen, should we maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what we're trying to do and, and maybe uh, what we don't know and why we would love to work with, uh, with uh, veterinarians out there across the, the U.S. To, to help fill some knowledge gaps? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, we, we don't know a lot about antibiotic prescribing in cats and dogs. Um, a lot of the reports on antibiotic use are really limited to like one institution. Um, and maybe that is an academic um, institution which involves a lot of referral patients and doesn't necessarily reflect um, sort of what's going on globally as far as antibiotic prescribing cats and dogs in the US. Um, and, and the reason why knowing that is important is that unless we know what we're doing, we really don't know where we need to go. We don't know what are the areas that we got, you know, we're doing really great at. We don't know what are the areas that we struggle with a little bit more. And um, as a profession, we need more resources um, or help. Where do we need to engage um, with uh, colleagues and pet owners to improve the way that we treat uh, animals. I think, you know, the goal ultimately always is to improve pet health. And so um, that's something that we feel passionate about. And as, um, as, you know, an individual practitioner or a clinic, it's something that you can help with too. So if this is something that you're concerned about too, um, 
please join us. We, we have a study um, that is uh, attempting to collect that national antibiotic use, antibiotic prescribing data in cats and dogs um, that's kicking off this summer. Um, what's really cool about it is that with minimal effort from each individual, we can combine a lot of data and say something really big and important and hopefully move the profession forward. Um, so the, the, the study that we are currently recruiting for is a, a national antibiotic use survey in, um, in cats and dogs. And we're looking at all patients that come into a clinic on one single day. Um, and that day um, could be, it's later this summer within a three week window, you can choose the day. Um, and we're just going to ask for information about those patients, whether they were prescribed an antibiotic or not prescribed an antibiotic and um, what they were seen for, what antibiotics were prescribed. And um, the data will be combined and aggregated all together so we can say, um, we can provide some national estimates on antibiotic use in cats and dogs. Amanda, do you wanna add to that? No, I mean, I I think that that is a great summary. I, you know, um, I have been adding like little tidbits about, uh, you know, how, how things work in healthcare, which I think in this situation is actually pretty relevant because it's like Jen said, um, we really want to and need to have a snapshot of what's happening in the U.S. Um, because we, you know, for example, we need more guidelines. We need guidelines for diarrhea. We need to figure out what are the other areas where, you know, we're not entirely sure um, whether we're prescribing uh, a lot or a little for certain conditions. And so um, what CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, actually has done for several years now, for several iterations, is they have used this approach in hospitals and nursing homes and essentially asked states, health departments, so um, I, I work at Minnesota Department of Health and we participate in this and what we do is we get um, human hospitals and human nursing homes to all collect one day of data and then we collect that and we send that to CDC and CDC puts that together across the whole US and that's how we know um, that you know what what percent of nursing home residents 75 percent uh, receive an, an antibiotic uh, and 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 what does that look like? What are the places for improvement? And so this approach is a way to collect information from across a whole lot of different uh, practices. So for our small animal practices, and then combine that so that we can um, have more data to, to figure out, you know, what's the next step and also get ourselves a baseline so that what we wanna do is repeat this um, in two years and see, you know, how have we improved um, you know, what else, what else do we need to, to work on? Yeah, and I so, think, yeah, go ahead, Jen. I was going to say, I feel like um, veterinarians in general are really data driven. You know, we all try to practice evidence-based medicine and we like to see numbers. <laughs> um, and so I think that providing, um, we, us veterinarians, um, information about antibiotic prescribing, um, you know, at the very base level is just going to create some awareness about um, what we're doing. And then, um, and, and like uh, uh, Amanda, you already mentioned, you know, what, where are areas where we need more support and um, resources? So, so probably so many people are wondering, how can we participate in this? Because this sounds really great. And I have a few hours to collect a day of data from my patients. Um, so what, what should I do next? How, why, you know, how can I help? So you can help by enrolling in our study. Um, if you go to uh, our website, arsi.umn.edu, you will find um, a link to uh, point prevalence surveys. I can show you really quick here. So here's our website, oops. Um, and we looked at clinical resources, but if you click over to this 
um, tab, you'll see there's a general and referral practices PPS. So this is a point prevalence survey. And what that means is that we're just collecting uniform data at one point in time, so one day in time across multiple practices. So um, you can click here to let us know that you're interested and then we can follow up with information. There's information here about like what, why participate? <laughs> and we can um, talk about that in just a second. Um, how, uh, what, what does um, participation really entail? So, and lots of frequently asked questions are available um, for you to check out. So again, arsi.umn.edu and click over here on the point prevalence survey tab and down to general and referral practices. So um, that's how you can start to help. So if you're interested in helping, so what, I guess the question that you may be asking yourself is like, okay, what's what's in it for me? Like, I understand there's this altruism of providing data for the profession, um, but it's been a really crazy year. So why should I take the time? Um, one one reason I think is uh, just to learn to uh, how to review antibiotic use data. Really, all of our practices have tons of information that we don't typically. Um, utilize. And so um, going through a single day of practice and seeing what you commonly prescribe for and what antibiotics you use might be revealing and then give you ideas about, you know, how you might want to keep track of that on your own. And we have some resources for that on our website as well. Um, those may provide ideas for you to um, think about how you want to um, create programs in your own practice. So um, maybe there's a lot of prescribing for tick-borne diseases and um, that that's an area where as a, a practice you want to um, develop a plan for um, prevention. The process of um, participation will also increase awareness of stewardship practices. Um, we aim to provide um, resources to you, but also a free continuing education webinar about antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial resistance in cats and dogs. And so you can get some free CE for the time that you provide for us um, and, uh, and gather some good information. Um, we also um, know that collecting this data is going to fill some huge gaps in um, in, in companion animal um, medicine, and so uh, hopefully you will uh, agree that that the information is needed and um, and will um, want to enthusiastically join us. Um, because once we have that data, then we have data for action. And I think action is um, the thing that's most intriguing for me, because those are areas that we can um, focus on, provide more resources, and, um, and ask for the help that we need so that we can uh, treat our patients um, more effectively. So Amanda, do you want to share, um, you know, if someone is excited about this? what will they need to do besides signing up? What does it really mean? What um, time are we asking them um, to commit? And, um, and what does that commitment look like? Yeah, yeah, so, um, okay. I, I think that's everybody's question always is, you know, how much effort am I gonna have to put in? And um, just as a reminder, the more people who actually put the effort in, the better data that we have for the entire profession. So what, um, clinics who want to participate will need to do is attend a one hour online training. And that's, um, you know, sort of like this, except with actual, <laughs> you know, communication about how to collect data and what we're looking for. Um, we'll show you how to fill data into an online form um, and, and give you all the information that you need in an online training. And then, of course, if you have any questions either during that training or after that training, you know, let us know and, and we can make sure it's all squared away. So, um, Spend a little bit of time, one hour, to, to know what we're asking you to do. The second thing is, is, as Jen mentioned, what we want to do is collect one day of information from your clinic, from all patients that were seen by a veterinarian on a single day. And so then what we'll ask you to do is collect that information. So what's great about this study is that if you use electronic records or if you use paper records, you can participate essentially find your appointment list, go through and um, input data into the online form about every patient that you saw, um, you know, signalment, uh, reason for presenting, um, and then any treatments uh, that were provided. We'll have a data dictionary that will help you to 
you know, pick, pick the right category of problem, pick the right category of visit type, you know, is it a sick visit, is it a well visit, is it a procedure, that type of thing. So everything will be outlined. So you, you sit down and you'll, you'll collect data or collect information from your medical records for a single day of practice. Um, you will also, uh, so the total time expected for that really depends on how many patients you see, depends on your caseload. Um, it usually is about uh, three minutes or less um, per patient for data entry. Um, and if your patient is not prescribed an antibiotic on that day, it's even shorter, maybe less than a minute. You know, just signalment, why did they come in? Did they receive an antibiotic? No. Um, uh, so that's how the data collection will go. And then just to know essentially a little bit about all of the clinics that are participating, um, we will also ask you to do a short pre-survey and post-survey. Um, and so we'll be asking questions about the, the type of um, community you live in. Are you urban, rural, um, metro? Uh, you know, how, what your approximate caseload is? Um, what type of services you have? Um, do you have a stewardship program? So general general questions that we can also use to put sort of next to the clinical data to understand um, uh, you know what this snapshot really means um, and so what we're asking for once we get that all going is to um, complete the data entry by uh, October 31st so you would have about two months to get those data collected um, but probably the time that it would take to, to do that would be you know less than a day, less than eight hours to collect that, depending on your caseload. Could be considerably less if you have a small caseload, um, but probably not more um, than a day. Jen, anything I missed on that? Yeah, I I was just gonna say yeah. If you depending on your caseload, you know it could take an hour to input everything, and you do it you know um, one morning over coffee, or um, you can certainly break it out and do it in little chunks of time as, as, as your schedule allows. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we're not collecting any sensitive information about pet owners um, or about uh, veterinary practices, um, veterinarians or, or um, staff. So that's not something we're interested in. We're just interested in antibiotic use. Um, and the reason why we're collecting data on patients that are not prescribed an antibiotic is that we want to get a rate of antibiotic use. So we kind of need to know how many patients did you see in total in order to know, you know, the percentage of those that received an antibiotic. Um, the yeah, I guess, I guess I think you covered everything. And certainly if you have more questions, reach out to us. If you're interested and you click that button on our website, you're not signing your life away. You can certainly let us know if you have, um, if you need more information um, in order to make a decision about participation. But we really hope everybody will participate. Um, the more uh, folks that participate, sort of the more, um, uh, you know, powerful that data will be. Um, so, so please do consider it. And if you have um, questions, let us know. Um, Amanda, uh, we do have some questions for folks that are listening now. Uh, do you know of any um, efforts or resources for pet owners without insurance to access more diagnostics? I guess, as far as I know, there, there are things like care credit, which is you know, not necessarily helpful for someone that has financial limitations because it just really kicks the can down the road. Um, but that can be an option for someone who, um, you know, needs to have diagnostics now, um, but doesn't have the resources to pay for those diagnostics until a month or a few months down the line. Um, do you know of any others, Amanda? I don't, I don't really. I think that one of the and this is sort of the communication piece. It's not exactly an answer to this question. I, uh, but you know, communicating with clients about you know, diagnostics can help us get it right at the beginning. And so maybe the overall process of, of um, diagnosis and, and treatment might take less time and overall less money if we get you know, real specific answers in the first place. There was a survey of, of veterinary that was conducted, I think, in 2015 um, by Heather Fowler out in Washington State, and es essentially asking uh, veterinarians what um, what led to use of culture and sensitivity 
um, testing. And oftentimes veterinarians were using it because there was a recurrent infection or a, a treatment failure. Um, and, and so we are as a profession more likely to be using those diagnostics when previous treatment hasn't worked. So, you know, depending, every situation is different and every individual client's, you know, financial situation in, in wiggle room is different, but I, certainly part of the conversation should be just the long, what's the long run looking like um, with regard to getting, getting a better answer for more targeted treatment right away versus taking more time to figure out the situation. There may be, depending on your locale, there may also be um, low cost clinics that are available regionally. Um, some, um, there are some opportunities for grant writing for, um, for uh, providing resources for uh, lower no income pet owners to be able to care for their pets. And um, I know, we, you know, we're at a, I'm at an academic institution, we have, um, we have funds for, for those here and those are based upon donations, but there are other um, resources out there where um, there, there are uh, uh, grants available to get um, funds for, for those types of owners. I don't know them off the top of my head, um, but I think a little Googling could, could lead you to those. Um, another question was uh, about mitigating liability risk if you choose not to use empiric antibiotic prescribing in, in those situations of diagnostic uncertainty. And I think, you know, again, that's part of the milieu of the clinical decision-making um, uh, that, that we have when we're in those exam rooms and, and we have a situation where we don't know exactly what's going on. So, you know, we have, um, you know, a concerned pet owner, we have a sick pet, um, we have certainly the medical information that we have in front of us, which is m many times just our physical exam and, and the clinical history that we can um, provide but there's also this idea of like what is my what is my responsibility here and if I get it wrong if I guess wrong um, is there going to be a consequence to me and um, I, I think that in this situation there, there may be just as much liability if we prescribe an antibiotic and there's an adverse event of the antibiotic than if we don't prescribe and, um, and the patient's clinical condition gets worse, um, the clinical condition might get worse, not because of a bacterial infection, but because of an, another disease process. So if we can't do the diagnostics, I don't think we would know either way. So I'm not sure what our liability would be in that situation because you know, if we don't know what we're treating, then it's really difficult to treat. Um, but I think the way that I would approach this would be, again, really just focusing on, on client communication and explaining um, the risks and benefits of both treating and, and not treating with an antimicrobial, um, you know, what our limitations are um, clinically when we just don't have enough information, because we, that's just the reality of the situation. If we're unable to do diagnostics or we have, um, you know, I'm an internist, so I see a lot of things where like we never figure out what's going on and we're doing a lot of um, really rational um, uh, you know, guesses. Uh, so I think client information, uh, client education is important in that situation. And then obviously documentation. So I know that this gets drilled into us veterinarians all the time, but, you know, documenting the conversations that you've had um, and the reason for your clinical decision-making in your medical record, I think is um, the thing that's going to save you from, um, from liability. Um, and there, there may be times where you don't, you can't do a culture, but um, you feel really likely that this patient with acute kidney injury likely has a pyelonephritis. Well, you know, just because you don't have that diagnosis doesn't mean you're not going to treat in that situation. So, um, so I think that we have to just rely upon um, ourselves or maybe consultation with our colleagues to, to make sure that the decision we're making is the best that we, the, the most appropriate for that patient in that situation. But if we really don't think that antibiotics are um, required, um, but we don't have the availability to do diagnostics to figure out what's really going on, then just document it. Yeah, document it. And I think that, you know, like Jen said, communication with the client, but also taking advantage of maybe uh, one of those sheets to send home with the client, asking them to check back in with you. 
or you know, setting up a, a call so the technician can give them a call in a couple of days. In particular, if you're feeling um, not entirely certain about about that decision. Um, and you know, one thing that we we haven't really talked about is sort of the other way around. If an antibiotic is prescribed, um, sometimes we need to prescribe an antibiotic, and then we get additional information later on, whether it's from diagnostic testing that comes back how the animal has reacted to the, to the antibiotic how, or responded. Um, and so I think that just in general, oftentimes we have a patient there and we have to make a decision at that time, but I think it's also helpful to think, you know, a little bit broader, like, you know, if we decide to treat or not to treat, it doesn't mean we couldn't decide the opposite the next day if we have additional information or if, or if patient condition changes. So documenting that, communicating that with the patient um, and, and following up, uh, whether that's them checking back in with you or, or vice versa, uh, is, a good, is a good approach. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, you know, if you're in a situation where you feel that a bacterial infection is maybe more likely than it's not, and you don't have all the information and you do elect to treat, you know, have that pet come back in in three days or give the owner a call in three days and find out if the patient clinical situation is improving. Um, if it's not, then I feel like, um, you know, we, we need to have the discussion with the owner about this is not working. Um, you know, can, can we try something else? Can you come back in? Can we do more diagnostics? And then it is working, then maybe you're um, on the right track and um, can continue that antimicrobial therapy. I mean, there's like this a misconception that once we start a, a course of antibiotics that we have to complete it, but if it's not doing what we had expected to do, then we can stop it. And then that way we um, mitigate the risk of um, complication from the antibiotic if it's actually not doing what we expect it to do. And you, Jen, that is a common question that you get or a common misconception, right? Because we've all been told, you know, take all of the antibiotics that you're prescribed. Um, but, but yeah, so I think that that's a good point. Yeah, I, um, I, I know that, that there are some infections certainly where that's true. You really need to like take antibiotics beyond when you're feeling better, like strep throat. <laughs> We've had that in our family. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if, if, for example, you're prescribing for like a recurrent lower urinary tract infection and you gave an antibiotic, but you have a culture pending and you get a culture report back that says that antibiotic's not effective, you're not gonna continue that, right? You would mm -hmm. stop it and try something else. So there, there are no rules that say you can't stop it if it's not working. Right. Or if you, ha or if you find an alternative diagnosis mm -hmm. that's, that indicates it's not a bacterial infection. I don't see any more questions, but I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you for your consideration and participating in our antibiotic use survey. Again, check out arsi.umn.edu, so U-M-N, which is University of Minnesota, .edu, um, and check out the Point Prevalence Survey tab if you would like uh, more information about our study or if you already know that you'd like to join us. Um, also check out arsi.umn.edu if, if you're interested in any of the resources that we showed you or talked about today. They're all under um, clinical resources and click on the small animal resources tab. Um, and just, I just thought of one additional thing to mention uh, that I will be presenting at AVMA this year. Um, some of the information that we have in our companion animal stewardship handbook. Um, so, you know, what are some things that you can, you can do uh, to implement stewardship practices in your clinic right away using that, that handbook as a guide. Um, and that session is on Sunday, uh, August 1st at 11 uh, central. So if you, if you are able, to, if you're attending AVMA, um, you know, please join me and, um, and there'll be a question and answer session. So we can talk about some of these concepts then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.